Hey, welcome back to the Bug Junkie Podcast. Your host, Malcolm. Got Mark and Jamie here. We, uh, Mikey has changed on us, guys. <laughs> yeah, look a little rough. rough weekend. I, I don't know if y'all could see that on the camera, but Mikey's done growed hair all over him. Got some big old tuskies coming out of his yeah. mouth. And... Smells pretty ripe. <laughs> what do you got there, Mark? <laughs> Man, that is a big boar. <laughs> no doubt. That came from Michigan, right? Michigan. Good buddy of ours, Frank, up there in Michigan. We met Frank through uh, J. Craig with Outlaw Smokers. Of course, y'all all know we, we competition cook as another hobby, so that's how we met Jay. But his good friend, neighbor, killed this hog about 20 years ago. It's an old mount then. Yeah. And he's supposed to be getting me the full details on it, but I want to say it was 750 pounds. I think. It's a monster. Yeah, I mean, it's... It's, it's not, not like, it's not a feral hog you shoot around here no, in Mississippi no. or Tennessee or nowhere like that. But no, it's like that's one of them Russian boars. Yeah. yeah. It's it's a hoss. I would hate to walk up on that dude alive on the hoof. I got a picture of him and we'll I don't know if we can do this. Can you put a picture in the middle of the podcast? Oh but yeah, Brian can do anything. We'll uh <laughs> we'll post a picture of him with Frank after he killed it and it's it looks like a dinosaur. I mean, so it's, it's big. It's probably got eight inch tusk on it, probably. Pretty least. close. The way we came about it, it's I'm building my house. Down at the farm, I'm building kind of a, I, I guess you, I'm calling it a smokehouse. It's going to have outdoor cooking there. It's going to have us a big indoor air man cave area, and we're going to put a pool table in there. We're like, we can film our videos inside if we want to. And I needed, I was going to start putting some mounts in there. Well, Jay was back here hunting with us last winter, like deer season, and I, and I told him, you know, I guess it came up, I'd went to Texas and shot some hogs, but there wasn't any, I mean, it wasn't something I was going to mount. And he's like, I know a guy that may have. Did he want to get? He wanted to get rid of he it. Was, or? I mean, it's it's physically so big. I don't know if this is not doing it justice, but this hog is physically so big. You have to kind of plan your home decor around <laughs> yeah. where you're gonna hang it. You yeah. know. So he's tried to get rid of it. He asked me to get it, and I was like, man, that is pretty cool. But we were up there and didn't have room to haul it back. And Emily said no go to. Yeah, Emily sure. said no go. <laughs> But well, I'm calling my smokehouse the boar's nest, and I think I needed a boar <laughs> mount. Need a boar. So they so so officially, this boss hog is going to be in the <laughs> in the smokehouse at the boar's nest. He's going on the wall. I'm going to proudly show off Frank's hog. But he's, it's that that right there is like a once in a lifetime type deal. I mean, the hunt of it. You think about. I wouldn't know what to think. Walk up on that. Uh, man, have y'all, Jamie? So you out there at the island used to be caretaker, right? Did you ever see any hogs close to that no, size? No, no. no. What was I mean, the biggest, seen, biggest hog? I mean, just see? guessing 200, 200 plus pretty easy as some of them. And yeah, it was no, it ain't no comparison. I was going to say 350, 400 is a big hog around here. You know, that's a, yeah, that's that's, a monster hog. Yeah, I believe that can go well over that. Yeah. So over in Georgia, I know they have, you know, that's where Hogzilla and all them big ones are from, but those are different type animals than what we have too. And we'll, uh, we'll make sure. If you're watching this on YouTube or whatever, we'll put the details on the hog down below. Frank's supposed to be messing me all the stuff on it, so if we don't get it in this podcast, we'll make sure you see the details on it. So you think a jump dog would jump on a hog at us? Oh yeah, they got them once. Up. Hey, catch, they, <laughs> yeah, it, it'd probably take more than one catch dog. Yeah, once. Yeah, a, yeah. them catch dogs pretty bad. Can you imagine grabbing a hold of a boar like that's nose and trying to pin it down? <laughs> I don't think you'd want to. Man, I do. He looks like he'd tear you up. I'd hate. I mean, I'd hate to meet him. That's a what he shoot him? You don't That's know what, what I was him with? I was wanting yeah, to find yeah. out is what he shot him with. Yeah. I might want something a little bit bigger in our three fifty legend on that one. <laughs> when we get him on the wall, y'all will see him in the video in a, in a better form. But since Mikey's not here with us today, he had some bit work business to handle down in Jackson. So we know we let the hog. I don't think that. Chair. I got the picture of him that you sent me. I guess or Jay sent me. I got the one with him, like behind the. I hog. don't think it's been it. Looks like a AR style platform. Oh, what he shot on the picture, yeah. Oh, it does. I bet that's a three hundred eight. Yeah. yeah, I don't know if it, how long. I don't know. It might be a blackout. Yeah, be a blackout. I think that hog there would laugh at that. They use. I mean, that's what you know. I mean, that's, that's, what, that's what they use out in Texas. Oh, yeah. Pretty damn big. God, that dude looks like in that picture right there. He looks like he's twelve foot long. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, he's <laughs> he's big. He's behind the hog in the picture, but it's not like. Some of your white tail deer, long arm, arm and no, yeah, uh, no. no. no he's just arm. trying to look over the top of him. There ain't no long arm in that one. No. You got to get the camera right to get it in the picture. <laughs> I mean, you, you got to get back from it. He's so big. But well, I'm sure we'll talk about this hog more. And again, if we film down at camp, you'll see the hog in the picture. Yeah, and yeah. it's a uh, we're pretty proud of it. I know I know Frank's glad it's going to a good home, and it's pretty cool to say that's at our deer camp. Yeah. So last week we talked about more of our spring maintenance things where we had to get done. 
before uh you know after deer season before we get into turkey season and all that we talked a little bit we talked a lot a bit about turkey hunting getting ready for that it opens we're, we're filming this one on tuesday we'll probably release it here end of the week but turkey season will be open by the time this podcast comes out game on but it eventually opens on. tomorrow tomorrow yep. yeah youth youth season went on Man, I was going to take Michael hunting, and that jerker, he went to a buddy's birthday bonfire and spent the night and didn't want to get up and go hunting. So Your times are counting I, down. I told him, hey, if he, you know, that, that was it. i take my gun tomorrow, so <laughs> I don't need him to go. Well, we're going down there tomorrow, <laughs> ain't we? Yeah, we might, are. Might have to go down there about 5.30. So, yeah. They start videoing at 8 ish yeah. I still, you know, we still hadn't really been shed hunting a whole lot. I've been down there a time or two. But, man, even last night on the camera, I was like, we finally, you know, not seeing any bucks with horns. We are still getting stragglers. They showed up. That still have horns on them. And we had someone, so I guess um, a listener uh, commented in on the podcast, and I don't know if it was on one of our videos or how Mikey got the email, but Mikey shared it with me before he left. It was a, a guy that they had a similar situation. They had a biologist look at it, and they said, that if your deer are still holding, you know, antlers this late in the game, that it proves whatever you're doing nutrition wise is working, because they say those deer have so such good nutrition that their antler growth, are you know, it's holding them on. They're right. not stressed out after rut. Um, they're they're doing the the overall health of your bucks is fantastic, and they say what'll happen is when they do drop, and they will drop uh, pretty soon, that they're immediately going to go back into growth and that next year, he's, he's, he promised us, he said, I guarantee you, you're going to see bigger and better and healthier bucks, bigger racks than you've ever had if they're holding them this late. And I want to see if that's true. Yeah. It's like Have y'all ba- ever heard anything like that? It's like baby teeth. Yeah. <laughs> Pushing the little ones off yeah, and put a yeah. big one on. I've never heard that. Yeah. I know nutrition has a lot to do with it. I mean, that's, I mean, that's common sense. I've never heard there. nutrition – have anything to do with them dropping, but as far as putting them on heavier, faster, yeah. stronger, yes. But I've never, I've never looked. I mean, you don't think about nutrition being you know, it's going to hold the horns longer. Yeah. But, you know. I would love to get a biologist to come in and look and see what they look like as compared to the sheds we found last year to when we finally find some this year to what they do next year. Yeah, because that's what's going to that's what's going to show that year round food plots work, habitat management works. Um, we can't supplemental feed. We can't supplement minerals. We can't do any of that stuff. So it's all on natural. Uh, what what what's growing, and then what we grow for. Right. That's all it is. So we definitely know for a fact in the last three to four years what they have down there to eat protein wise and nutrient yeah. wise is way better than it, than was, it was when we got. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So well, we li- we listened to a meat eater podcast coming back from Indiana the other day, and <clears throat> they had a guy on there. That's what he does for a living. Is he sells sheds, and he said. But, now, I'm talking, not talking about like selling like one or two. I'm talking about eighteen tons, wheeler loads, yeah. like so, filling up containers with so, deer sheds for like making furniture and fixtures. No, uh, he said, "Yeah, the chandeliers are like your yeah. prime A class." I guess he, I think he called it like a brown, brown and not bleached out white or chalky. And it got, it'll go. I mean, he said, it "Don't matter if it's a three or four year old shed, it's chalky or whatever what they call it. They can still sell it, but it's all most of it's shipped overseas for." Uh, Medical uses and stuff like that. His so biggest thing, uses. yeah, huh. they, something to do with the calcium and stuff. Yeah, so for. yeah, you they can grind it. They, or they turn yeah, it into calcium powder. tablets. Oh. I mean, you can get. He said anywhere from fourteen to seventeen, eighteen dollars a pound for a shed. So it, are they are they selling like white tail sheds? Are these everything, everything. White, everything. white tail, any moose, kind of antler elk. that drops. Yeah. So, so all that guy does is go around finding sheds. Yeah, he's he's actually got like. <laughs> like me and Mark do your wholesale, and he's actually got buyers. He's got salesmen and buyers. Yeah, buyers that yeah. go to. I, he didn't talk like they bought a lot from, like high fence farms. He talked yeah. most of most of it was like wild, you know, out in the wild, just people that actually shed hunt. And the the funniest thing I thought is like it's some of these sheds that he have bought and said he like he went to the show, he bought a truckload of sheds, loaded it up, put it in his trailer, went back to the hotel, was getting ready for bed, gets a phone call it's from the local police department. They have put a tracker in the shed and found out the guy he bought it from had stole it. Oh, and they wow. were tracking the sheds like with GPS trackers. Trying to see where they were going. Mm-hmm. Who was, who oh, was he even said that it was people in trouble? that he didn't know that reported like they had sheds, you know, around their barn at home or out on the land. And they come back and he said it was the money so good in sheds that people were actually stealing, stealing them out like of the front somebody yard. Somebody the clean out pop shop or yeah, yeah, yeah. shop. Yeah. yeah. It was wow. good money. Can but you imagine that? Somebody broke in and stole, <laughs> stole all sheds. your sheds. Yeah. 
he uh the number one thing and I think the states he was saying was for dogs like they're like chew bones he has oh, a lot yeah, of people yeah like that now yeah there for peak back in late two thousands it was furniture use and now now it's the probably one of the number one it is for dog chews I didn't know they did medical with them he, yeah. he was talking about how many athletes take the calcium tablets that are made from deer sheds really and they's like said so one of the studies they done or one of the athletes he didn't say a name but like had some type of like knee surgery. And the doctor come in and like gave him the calcium tablets, and he took them, and his knee quit hurting, and he quit taking the calcium tablets, and boom, his knee started back hurting. So he's on a full time regiment now, like with calcium tablets. And I guess it's like kind of like a Tylenol. I don't know, but yeah, I don't know, man. You got me. I've never heard of that. All I know is what yeah. Grant, when you're cutting deer horns off, that smell. If that tablet tastes like it, I don't know if I can swallow it. <laughs> yeah. It'd be so bad. So do they they don't do anything to them. They're just all na- they're natural. They can't preserve them or stop them from changing. Right. Color yeah. He just said. I think the percentage or the strength or whatever potency or whatever of the calcium you know the older yeah. whiter chalky one's not that's it's not gonna bring as much money as a fresh brown one you know fresh drop one well you know squirrels and rats and all kinds <clears> of <throat> chew on them for calcium so i've heard that before yeah. and then it was I've even something to do it was a i don't remember what the benefit was but even if it was one that still had velvet on it it would bring it put it in a different price point a different price margin because it retained I guess the blood and more of that yeah. in, in the in the shed itself or the horn it's itself. There. It was pretty good. It was crazy to think because they said it was a, I want to say it was like a 40-foot container. Uh, yeah, had. it was, yeah. And he said it, they pack, they don't just like throw them in there. Like strategically placed in there like yeah. stacking them. Yeah, he said it's like literally packed every square inch. Is I don't forget what the, what, what the average price per pound was. It uh, was pretty substantial. It was around, I think, it, I think he said, it, you know, a, a class A or class 1, Top shed would be around seventeen bucks a pound, I think. And he said average. He said average right now is around fourteen a pound. Wow, I never. I mean, I would I never do. People sold them, and I can buy lunch on like all the ones I got hanging up. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, take a moose shed or something that's fifteen, yeah, yeah. fifteen, sixteen pound. That's so. Where's money. this biggest area they come from? I didn't catch it, that. Yeah, uh, uh, I mean, I just assuming it'd be like Montana, Colorado, out that way. They basically just how you got like fur trade, yeah. like it's the shed market trade. Same thing. You go to shows to buy sheds. I mean, I would think the biggest population, what did you say, Texas? Probably more deer in Texas than any other state. Probably that yeah. way out west. I'm sure. Michigan's got a huge population. Mississippi's got a huge population yeah. of deer. I've never heard. Most, I've never heard of anybody selling sheds in Mississippi. Have y'all? My, most of them he was talking about was all out more out west yeah. than it was anywhere else. Let's see if I can pull up it's the price. But he said, I mean, I need like to check that out. He said he could literally pull up in a town, no advertisement on his vehicle, no advertisement on his trailer, just pull up in a hotel, and before the night was over, somebody's going to call and say, hey, man, I hear you in town. I got some sheds I want to sell you. Really? That must hmm. be a, like a, I don't know, a, not a black market, but a something real secretive. <laughs> yeah. So there's a antlerbuyers.com. Yeah. Uh, we buy sheds, huh? Yeah, basically. Like junk cars or yeah, the, the website pile. won't pull up, but in the description it says 2022 antler prices: elk grade A, eighteen dollars a pound; elk grade B, twelve dollars a pound. Uh, moose antlers. This is going back to what Jamie said. Brown select grade is thirteen dollars a pound. Now I have heard that there are a lot more shed hunters than there are actually deer hunters. Or so if hunters. you like, there's some families that plan their vacations around going. Oh to yeah, sheds. yeah, it's a. I can't remember. It's on Facebook. It's like two different forms, whatever. If all of that's what it is, shed hunting. And these guys are like every day posting. This one guy's already like, I don't know how many days, but his one hunt was like 130 sheds he found. Yeah. And it was like crazy. Well, if you think about it, if you hit government land, it's like the state of Mississippi. We got a lot of government land. And you just wanted to spend a weekend walking government woods looking for mm-hmm. sheds, that wouldn't be no problem. And don't we could do it here around the house yeah. and, and take forever yeah. to cover all the government land. Like, just think you go out to Arca Butler. Where Rob's is out there. That's anybody Strike can go. Walking. Anybody can go walking anywhere out there. Yeah, any government land. You, yeah. you mean you, you talk about just walking around that lake alone would take you a while looking. I mean, for sheds, it's got to be a technique to it because they're not as easy to find for yeah, me. No, I mean, after y'all get done turkey hunting this weekend, I'm probably gonna have to, go, have look. to go look. Yeah, oh, I, almost. I got home left early and then it's time change and I almost me and my wife almost went down there yesterday looking, but I was like, man, I, said, I, didn't, I didn't know if y'all was youth hunting this weekend or this week or yeah. I need turkey season opening up tomorrow and I don't want to throw a screw wrench and yeah. run off them gobblers. I got them staked out. I know where they at. <laughs> I know where, I know where one's at. <laughs> I know where two's at. 
Actually, I know where about eight's at. I don't know how big they are. One, two, three. <laughs> yeah. All right, we're good. We can we, we, we two a day. Yeah, before Mikey gets back in town, we can go ahead and shoot some. <laughs> Get it out of the way. Next thing up, see, we got three fifty uh Bear Bear Creek. Hey. We got the three fifty legend and the four fifty bush so, in last week. We got both of them in. It's a full three fifty legend, right? It's an upper Correct. and lower. Or it's a we got a lower, but we got two uppers. We got a three fifty legend. And then we got the 450 Bushmaster up. These are Bear Creek guns. Bear Creek guns. Y'all know we like our Bear Creeks. I don't care what y'all say about them. We'll keep shooting them. They it's keep the working, killing deer. It's the working man's gun. <laughs> but, uh, I had never shot a 450. Have y'all no. No. seen anybody? It's a short little fat dude, though. So what did y'all, y'all talk to some people up at that sports show? About? So yeah, we talked. That was the booth that we kind of – so we'll get into the sports show and kind of tell you all a little bit more about that. But really one of the only hunting booths was right up across from where we were set up. Which what hilltop outfield? Yeah. Hilltop, hilltop outfield or outdoors? I yeah. Can't remember. I got it pulled up. I'll look up, but they had, uh, they had a couple of guns up there and they had some stuff like on display and they, what was it? Scopes. They were selling 50% off. Yeah. They had scopes. Uh, really everything they had was, it was, I looked at even clothing. It wasn't some, I mean, it was name brand like mossy oak or real tree or whatever camo pattern, but, like the clothing line, somewhat wasn't like a for our area name brand. What I looked, to us. it was all nice stuff, very stuff, very good looking stuff at a but a super good price. They had one of those cable wheels, kind of like we got out in the store out here, stacked top to bottom, four fifty Bushmaster, loaded up with ammunition. Really? And that's like from what I've heard. We talk, bought some of that ammo. Well, I, was, man. I started to, but I was like, oh, we'll be able to get it at home, no problem. Yeah. But uh, got to talking to some of them guys, <clears> and that's probably the number one round what i gathered up there is man. what most of them are shooting it's a lot of lead from what i've been looking at man i mean they started about 200 grains yeah. and then you know, they he was up. shooting 250 i think what yeah, that's what he was. Was shooting, yeah and like the selling point on it is a lot of people already have a gun on the ar platform to start with so you're just yeah. buying the upper and then kind of like he said and i've never really thought about it is you can adjust most of them got adjustable butt stocks on you can just a, a kid, a kid can use it to you know this morning, and you can extend it out, and you can use it this afternoon. You're both shooting the same gun. I wonder, like, what's the recoil like on the 450 versus the 350? He said it. He said he couldn't hardly tell. I'm sure it's going to be a little bit more because it is a heavier round. But he said it's still very manageable for a kid to handle. What's effective range of it? About, about the, same. the same. Yeah, it's not cover. quite as flat as shooting as a 350, but it's again, throwing a brick at it. <laughs> you put you put the scope on it like we're doing with the Leopold and. You can adjust for elevation. They're set for it, you know. So they make that for loophole freedom mm-hmm. for the yeah. uh, for yep. the 450, just mm-hmm. like the 350. The only thing is, which we shoot bullets that that scope says shoot. I think we shoot 150 grain for a 350. I don't know what turrets already on that scope, but we can either do that or call Leopold up and say, "Hey, I'm shooting these bullets," and they'll send you another turret to go right on it. So that's no big deal at all. Yeah. 200 yards, no problem. He said 300. Yeah, he, I mean, he, he said, said he's comfortable with three. Yeah, he no was shooting three all day with his. With the with the 450. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Now, you're four. lobbing it. Now, I was but, fixing to say, it's got to be slow because it's probably 900. But you let that big old brick right? hit something, I mean. It's punching a hole. Heck, yeah. So is it the same, about the same round as like the 45 muzzle loader, 45 caliber? So or it's the it? same caliber. It's a little bit shorter round, I guess. You don't the have, lead itself is yeah. Smaller. It's not like it's not as long as like a forty five seventy. Yeah, I don't know what they're doing different to get the trajectory because like I mean forty five seventy is done at a hundred yards, hundred fifty, you know. So I don't know what they're getting, you know, to be able to shoot that a little bit further. But I don't know if it's different powder or you know a little bit hotter powder how they're going about it. But it seems to work. And you don't know fit, what the ballistics are. You look. I hadn't looked at them that close. Um, one of the big selling points for them guys up there is they can shoot those in muzzleloader season now. Yeah. See, they don't have a they don't have a they don't, well, it's a one weekend rifle season. I guess yeah. all they got one or two weekend yeah. rifle yeah. season, then muzzleloader. Well, I think that's why those rounds they kind of introduced them for the like states that don't have rifle season. Yeah, or they're it's not a primitive weapon. There's no way. But what do they call it? A straight wall straight cartridge. wall cartridge pre well, if it's a new caliber, I don't know if it's really pre. I, th- I just don't 19- think it's, no, it's just straight, straight wall, wall cartridge. cartridge. Yeah, and. Basically, what I think it means is it just don't go as far. It don't have as much yeah. energy as a high powered rifle. It's a little bit better in a shotgun, a little bit more accurate, but and, and a muzzle loader. Yeah, you're not dealing with the black powder. It's I mean, but I mean, you're not so, shooting a twenty eight nozzle there. It'll yeah. bust out a thousand yards, That's no right. problem. You know? Yeah, if you're hunting government land where it's you know it's people 
close. In all honesty, probably too close. To, you're you know you're hunting kind of close to each other. I mean, shoot, that's the perfect. Round. So it's a safety issue. Yeah, I would imagine it has you, a lot to do with. Can you get you can get suppressors for them, or mm-hmm. I'm pretty yeah. sure they yeah. work. Right? Yep, and you can get those subsonic. So if you're you know varmint hunting or wanting to keep the noise down, or if a kid you know wants something a little bit lighter recoil, that's no problem too. Or it's easy on the ears. Easy on now, the ears. I know that 350 is loud, though. With that. Well, shoot mine. <laughs> <laughs> Jamie's <laughs> isn't bad now since he took the uh, muzzle Flash, break off yeah. and put just a thread protector. And that's something else, you know, we talked about mine not being that loud, but mine doesn't have a muzzle break. It just has a flash hider. Yeah. You know, so it's not directing that sound percussion right back at you. But you put one of them on there, no, it don't move at all. It don't kick. It don't. But it's loud. It's so loud. I got to get a, I got to get me a suppressor thing. Did y'all get some clips ordered for the 450? Yeah, I got them back there in my office now. So we should be good to go. We can put that gun together and put shoot that gun it together. Week, that scope should be delivered today, I believe. I need to pull up the Amazon account check, but it should be today. Double check and get that set up. We're going to put those videos out on YouTube. It'll be neat. You kind of go through. We're no, we're no gunsmith. We're no professional marksman. marksman. Yeah. yeah. We can put a scope on, make it somewhat straight, and we can make them hit. And we're gonna kind of go through that process, of what we do to do that. And I'm gonna of, shoot something with it next deer season. Heck yeah, we're gonna shoot oh, something with it more then. We can shoot some coyotes with it. Yeah, you know what? Go find us one of these hogs right here. <laughs> <laughs> Miles may have some. I don't know if he's got any of that stuff. But <laughs> so, all right. Speaking of the hog, he finally messaged back. It is a 500 pound Russian boar. It was killed in Nagina, Michigan, Upper Peninsula. So the UP of yeah. Michigan. It took me a minute the other day, and them guys kept somewhat UP. Like, what the heck? Were, what were you UPing about? Um, <laughs> it was at the Bear Mountain Lodge in 2012. He shot it with the Rock River Arms 458 SOCOM. So that was a lead right there. Yeah. That was a chunk. It was on an AR platform. 300 grain copper hollow point at 60 yards. One shot pass through, double lung shot. I think Drop we got the details yeah. from him. That's the full details there. Frank, that was right off your message. So, so how <laughs> how long ago was that? Twenty twelve. So Ain't been too long years. ago, yeah. We got some of our numbers wrong, but hey, it sounded good. Yeah. So, hey, so Do you think he ate any of it? I doubt it. I don't know. That joker was probably stout. Let me find out. <laughs> a little musky. <laughs> so backtracking a little bit last week, uh, I was talking to my buddy Brad, and he's bleeds turkey. He's diehard turkey hunter, and uh, he listened to our podcast last week about. Uh, pattern your gun and i yeah we didn't relate on this and i didn't really think about it he said so you know yeah double check you can get a cheap a cheaper load that's going that's going to pattern at 45 yards 40 yards but you ain't gonna have the knockdown to blow through feathers he said that's something else check you know just because it blows through a piece of cardboard at 40 yards but it's got a good pattern you need to put out something a little bit thicker like some plywood or something like that you know just to see you make sure shots I mean, going through it still shot does it on ducks you know, feathers are tougher than people oh, think. Oh, yeah. You know? Yeah. So I didn't just kind of throw that, that out there. Yeah, I didn't that think, makes sense. I didn't even, we didn't even talk about it. Never really thought about it much. But What he, what, what he tell you he shot? Did he tell you? The TSS man? I think so. I think the way he said he was shooting. So Those things are too expensive for me to pattern. I'm just going to have to say, yep, they're going to do good in mine because at $7 a dead gum round, yeah. that's a lot of money, man. But, I mean, Brad, just like Darren, I mean, he he's going to turkey hunt. You know, yeah. they're they going to they gonna, they gonna travel, and he gonna go, he's not going to just hunt Mississippi. So if you're doing that much, putting that much time, money, and effort into turkey hunting itself, it's worth knowing. To me, it's worth the money on the shell that you know is going to reach out 40 yards and have a deadly shot. Well, they, we need to get a big-time turkey hunter in here. Well, Darren and Brad, Darren both of them. Bra- yeah, yeah, Darren. You put, you Darren, put both of them on it, we're going to learn a lot. Yeah, because, I, I mean, I got questions. I absolutely am not, not a turkey hunter, but – it it's it's fun. I, I will say that. And I would what, say it's probably if you're related turkey hunting anything, it's probably as competitive and addictive as crappie fishing. Yeah. The one thing I'll say about turkey hunting is it's not as communal as deer hunting to me. Like you don't hear people getting together and going to camp. <laughs> hey, no, they're all mad at each other. Yeah. Yeah. They are. It's like secretive, man. No, they you do not. Wanna, if, they don't want to share. In if the, you was to lock turkey hunters and crappie fishermen in the same room. They're gonna die. Why? I mean, why is that? Why, so why do y'all think that I, is? Why are people? Why are they so protective? Is it? I mean, is it just because it's harder to kill a turkey, or why? Why I, do you have to be like that? I mean, I guarantee you, if you go out and hear a turkey but you don't kill it, and you see somebody that you know is hunting the same area, you're not gonna tell them. 
It's I'm all. Gonna, I, it's almost like you got a mission. I'm gonna be to straight outsmart. up with both y'all. So I need to be. So I need to shut up about where my turkey. Now keep talking. Keep all that don't apply to everybody, Malcolm. Keep the talking. hogs filling in for Mikey. Mikey yeah. ain't gonna tell you where that turkey is. Really? No. Oh, yeah. If he does, he's lying. <laughs> <laughs> Only way you gonna know where that turkey is if you're with Mikey. So I've, I, but I've noticed that talking <laughs> to turkey hunters, man, they're all yeah. Hey. You do this and you gotta get these calls. Not when it comes to hunting. I mean, one, I've had a bunch of them say. Now I'll come call one for you. I'll come call one for you. I don't but the whole time they're doing that, they're documenting their head. <laughs> where well, the most, turkeys are. And my dad's this way now is it's not necessarily the point of killing a turkey. It's the point of you outsmarting him. I, I think you're more. Before, too. I think you got more of that one with nature type feel that with people turkey. are like real protective <clears> over. I mean, I mean, it's just like crappie fishing. You're, you're fooling that fish. Yeah. I mean, deer hunting. Yeah. You still have to fool the deer a little bit, but. We go out there getting our. You can stand. pattern it a whole lot yeah. better. But we never, turn the heater on. Well, turkey, you ain't. You're not hunting in comfort. You're. Yeah. You're working. You know. I've never heard somebody say, "Let's go to turkey camp." You know, uh-huh. let's go hang out at turkey. I camp. heard a turkey. I'm going to put you on. Yeah, it. yeah, yeah. Heck no, they all going to go to fighting when they we go got, to turkey camp. Yeah. <laughs> I guess it's. I guess you hear. I guess no you, turkey brotherhood. No, you know, if you hear that turkey, but don't succeed on getting to the end. Every turkey hunt I know, they got a mission. They're going back to that turkey. and You know, I had that question. Say, so if you went shed hunting, we knew where some turkeys were. Or I went turkey hunting, and the turkeys made you. They see you, and they spook out. Are they going to come? Are they like an old buck where they won't come back? Or turkey? I, I mean, I don't, I don't think. I think they come back to the same roost tree or roost area. It's like their home. It's like a deer goes to bed in the area. But. This was daddy's analogy for turkeys. You know, everybody talks about how smart a turkey is. No, a, sm- a turkey ain't smart. A turkey's dumb as a box of rock. He's just scared to death scared of everything, to death everything out everything. there. Yeah. A leaf will fall wrong, and he's gone. He's you gone. know. Now, I ain't saying they're dumb because they can outsmart you while you're trying to call them in, but they are kind of dumb. You know how many times we sit in a deer stand I don't and watch call them, them turkeys for nothing. Yeah, <laughs> but that's what I can't. Honestly, I've never killed a turkey. I hadn't been a whole lot. This is what I don't understand. But everybody talks about how hard it is turkey hunt. Man, we can be in a deer stand, a climbing stand, move around with the orange vest on, and they never spook, never see you. But you go out there, put full camo on. Blink one eye, the they're ground. gone. Yeah. Get on the ground with them. Yeah. So why, and that's another thing. Why don't people hunt turkeys out of climbing stands? <laughs> they ain't looking up. Yeah. Have you ever, I mean, how many times have you walked and been in a deer stand? They just go all around your tree, and unless they get up in the tree beside you, they don't look up there. If they could smell, you'd, you'd never, never kill, kill them. Yeah, that's I right. That. Well, you go sit on the ground where they are. I mean, I'm talking about when you sit on the ground, you are eye level with them. They don't miss I mean, nothing. they're looking right at you. Why not get up? You know, just a little bit. <laughs> we need a bunch of turkey stands now. Yeah, yeah turkey stands. We got a new, new product line coming out. Turkey stands. You'd have to make it where you get in and out of them real quick, you yeah. know. Because you move to the next one. See, I think that's another thing. Turkey turkey hunters want to be mobile. You have they to want be. to go to the turkeys instead of letting the turkeys come to them, I guess. And I, you know, and maybe that's why it's so hard. If you knew where the turkeys were, it probably wouldn't be that hard to kill them. It's, I don't know. I, I don't turkey hunt enough to know the ins and outs, but it's, I've been a bunch of times with daddy and to watch them to where, you know, daddy always had it programmed in his mind. If that turkey was on the other side of a fall down tree, it wasn't crossing He's it gone. coming to you. You wasn't going to get him. I see, and we watched the gobbler do that, get up on a tree and walking down that tree back and forth. He never would step off on that side. Now, why? I don't know. Yeah. I can't explain it. Same so thing. That's what, I don't know enough about it. We so watch them fly across fly. ditches all hunting season and land in the field, but come turkey season, you ain't going to get them come across that yeah, ditch. So, so stuff like that, what I don't don't make sense yeah. to me. I've watched them cross a big ditch a bunch this deer season. Yeah, I have too. Every one of them went in that ditch and went on the other side, and then we'd come back on that ditch and come on the other side. The closest I had to kill one, man, was I was with my daddy, and it was a pretty good gobbler, and it was a it was a di- it was a they was in a cornfield that we didn't, it wasn't on the hunting club we was in. And there was a cornfield, a tree line, and then a ditch inside the tree line. The ditch was like the property line pretty much. And they would cross it. We, two hours, we watched him go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and he never would cross it. But yet, like you say, you're in a deer stand, and you're out in the woods, and they cross every ditch, every creek, <laughs> every whatever. Dog, whatever. Yeah, don't pay them no attention to it. I don't know what it. the difference is. I know you put out a bunch of crows. They're coming over there. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how many turkeys I saw try to fight some crows. <laughs> they hate them. <laughs> Uh, you, let got, a crow, you let a couple of crows light out in the field. There's some turkeys out there. They're beelining towards them. Now, I will give it to the turkey hunt community. Y'all make some of the best TikToks. I get so <laughs> tickled at some of them. I do, too. Talking about my neighbor's over there calling, and I'm standing on his head, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I like it's one with the little dude. He's eating on something. Yeah, and he looks, like, you know. Got a hot one over there. He said he already got it. I seen one this morning. It was a, 
He said, my neighbors are blowing his croak off for an hour, and I done killed a turkey. He said, I just gobble back at him. He said, he'd been trying to get to me all day. That'd be some good topic, good stories. You know, I've heard Daddy say this on government land. You know, you're sitting there calling the gobble answer or, or another turkey, and it's, another it's just nice. It's another hunter out there. You know, y'all are that close to each other. It's crazy. But, so, Jamie, how many how many miles did we go last week? We figured it up. Too long. <laughs> it was a long drive. I think it was right at 16, 1,700 miles. That's what y'all made. Yeah. Going up there didn't really seem too bad. Coming home, I was ready to get home, but it was, it was a long drive home. So y'all went to Grand Rapids, Michigan. So Via Mentone, Indiana. Via Mentone. So we left and get our buddy Jay on yeah. the way up. We left here on Wednesday, drove to Mentone, Indiana, which is about two hours north of Indianapolis. Between Indianapolis and Great Bend. So went up there. We took a trailer with us because we were picking up some smokers. So we dropped a trailer at his place, hung out, ate some fine groceries, mighty fine groceries. And then uh, got up Thursday morning, drove to Grand Rapids, got checked into the hotel, and went to the Ultimate Outdoor Show. And well, I would say they need to rename it. It needs to be the Ultimate Fishing Show because <laughs> fishing was strong. Is it one of these where uh, – Early spring, they do the f- fishing and part, it may and be. in the fall, yeah, yeah. they'll switch, and they'll do a big Because they did show. say they do another show yeah. that's, like, one of the biggest. Yeah, it's kind of flip-flopped all the booths. Like August that are, or September or something yeah. like that. Yeah, it's more booths for actual hunting. How or, many booths do you think there were at this one? Shoot. Hundreds. Yeah, easy. Over 100, was easy. I mean, it was. Was it an expo center or something? Where was yeah, it? Like yeah, like a big event center. Yeah. And we wasn't in half of it. I mean. No, it, no. With the, the opposite side was pretty amazing, too. It's a bunch of hand-crafted, hand-carved. Carving. Yeah, it'd be anywhere from a lamp to a bowl to decoration for the house. It's they had hand some hand-carved sungill or bluegill brim. You could, I mean, you it was literally like the decoys, like handmade decoys. Oh, yeah, yeah. I can't yeah. afford them, but yeah. Oh, they high dollar. That, uh, one of them brim was $900. Holy smokes. But it was, <laughs> if you looked at it, you would. It, if you'd have it, put it in water, you'd yeah, swore it real. I mean, yeah. it was, it had incredible detail to it. But, so we went up there. We, uh, we got there Thursday, got checked in. Uh, went and got all our credentials because we were there with an exhibitor. So we got to do a little. We got to get in the place early. Um, Y'all saw behind the scenes. Behind a the scenes, yeah. and that was that was kind of our goal. Is you know we want to do some of this stuff with buck junkies as well as how to barbecue right, and we kind of want to get an idea of what we're getting into. Yeah. Um, I will tell you, eight hours, ten hours, and that expo is a long day. It's a you wore out by you wore out, and you're not really you're you're on your feet is the biggest thing. You're never sitting down. You're on your feet. You're constantly talking to people. Um, but it was good, so we kind of got a firsthand experience. We we got there, and before the gates opened, we kind of walked around bef- and seen what was all there because we were we were wanting to get content for Buck Junkies too, you know. Yeah. And kind of just see what was going on, and I would say ninety percent of everything there was all fishing related, which is great. I mean, they had a ton of stuff. I mean, there was it was every kind of rod you can think of. Me and Jamie's never seen a ice fishing rod in person. And was a little bitty one, little bitty yeah. short one. I looked, yeah. I was like. I said, I ain't never seen that's, that's like a, a Snoopy, yeah, like a Snoopy, Snoopy rod in real here. But it was a $300 rod, and I was like, that ain't no Snoopy pole. You know? yeah. Fishing <laughs> but, in a 12 inch hole. Yeah. Or but that's big there. up there. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm not getting on the ice trying to catch no fish. I ain't that mad. I think, I think it'd think be pretty cool just to say you've done it. But, it'd be cool to say you've but, done it. I'm a sissy. I'd have to have the ice house with the heater and chair and, you know. That's what they do, though. Oh, they yeah. Stay in that thing all weekend. But, uh, so we, like I said, we were there with the exhibitor. We were able to go with uh, Mitten Barbecue Supply, which man, is, shout out to them. They took, they wined and dined us and took care of us. Where are they at? What town? Do you remember? I always forget what town that is. It is uh, Granville, Michigan. Yeah, Granville, Granville, Michigan. They're actually in a butcher shop, if I understood correctly. Right. Um, they kind of worked out a deal with the guy that owns the butcher shop, so they handle all the rub and supplies and everything, and he handles all the meat and got a pretty good spread of things. They they had a heck of a booth. Yeah. Um, I want to say it was three booths. Is what yeah, so they they're probably 30 foot, 35 foot long booth. And they basically brought everything from that store to <laughs> that expo. Yeah. Everything. and Set up a mini store yeah. right there. Had grills, had cooking supplies, had wood, had charcoal, had pellets. I mean, it was a little bit of everything going on. But we were able to go with them. And again, thank all them guys because it was that was no easy feat getting all that set up. And we kind of – it was <laughs> – He's like, y'all must have been standing outside waiting on us to get done and then come on in. I said, yeah, that's kind of the plan, you know, <laughs> taking it easy on us. But I would definitely go back. Um, I'd love to go back in a, in a if fall. They, if they do the for real, you know, all-out hunting side of it, like in the fall, it'd be pretty cool. 
It so was, they, but there was some hunting stuff there. There was yeah. some hunting stuff. So one of the bigger hunting booths was right across from our booth there. And that's some of the guys we got some content with. Uh, I bought a shotgun while I was up there from them. So. What'd you buy? I really don't know yet. <laughs> we hadn't figured it out. And if we got any listeners that are Benelli experts, I would love to talk to you because I've let multiple people look at this gun. and Nobody's seen one right here. Nobody's seen one and it's not adding up. And I don't know. So I bought a Super Black Eagle original. Of uh, the series one, it is not the, it is not the one you can ghost load or whatever they call it, where to hold the the yeah. four shell. Um, it's the model right after that. Um, I can't remember where it was imported to. I think it was Maryland. the The facility in Maryland is where it was made. Um, it was Super Black Eagle, and I just happened to be. We had gotten done doing a TikTok with them, and uh, was happened to look over the guy's shoulder, and I was like, "Well, no, no." Mark opened his mouth. He said, "Man, if that was a." Uh, one super black eagle one i'd buy it and the guys like sold <laughs> sold he reached up and grabbed <laughs> well, he, it. You, he saw you uh, yeah. well i seen it i was like man i like, said that looks like the camouflage on them old super black yeah guys. yeah so he picked up handed it to me and it was man the barrel on it was like super short and i was like what's going on with this and i looked and it didn't have a choke in it there's no choke it was smooth bore and the guy told me he's like i think you know my my way i understood this was the the gun had been shot. They blew the end of the barrel off. They took a bandsaw, cut the barrel off, made it to where it was still used for something. And that's how it was. But the gun had not been shot. I mean, very little. I mean, it wasn't no carbon in the gun. He let you go through it. Yeah. Like, I looked at it, pulled the lock out, done everything right there at the counter. And I mean, it it hadn't been shot much. It was a little dirt in it. I mean, you could tell it had been hunted with. So how old do you think it is? I would say, I think Six, that. Six, eight? Years, yeah, no, no, no. This is like a mid nineties model. Oh, okay. Gun. Like I would say around ninety eight. Yeah. I would guess. Maybe. I mean, none of the blue one on the bottom magazine was even more off from yeah. like loading a shell or ejecting a shell. Yeah, I would top. say mid to late nineties. My guessing, yeah, just yeah. looking at it. Um, wow. So I mean, it's an older gun. Twenty was, plus years. Yeah, it was clean. I mean, there was nothing wrong with it whatsoever. It worked good, cycled good, and uh, I was under assumption then, like, all right, the barrel's been cut. No big deal. I'll buy a barrel for it and. I kind of wanted to get one of these guns and completely build it myself and go through and get it Cerakoted, get all the work done to it, get a trigger job, get the, you know, the barrel worked, get everything mm-hmm. done to where it's just the ultimate custom Benelli. And I've always wanted a one. So I was like, screw it. Ended up getting a really, really good deal for it and kind of worked a deal with him. And I think I gave 400 bucks for it. I think it was 450 time I got out the door and paid the transfer fee. So, so, you, so you bought it. I bought it and took it out right there. And that was the thing. I was like, "You sure I can buy this?" Oh, that Michigan? was yeah, yeah. You're downtown, public street with forty, fifty people on the sidewalk at any time. Yeah, <laughs> with a gun. So in I was your like, hand. "You sure I can walk out of here with this?" He's like, "Yeah." He's like, "Well, you can sell. It. You can buy a log gun." I was like, "You sure?" He's like, "Yeah." So he gave me a case, put in it. Jamie wants to go get the truck. I was like, <laughs> "I'm not going walk- to a gun show here, in Mississippi, man. Yeah. You can get them." I said, "I ain't walking all the way back to the hotel toting this gun." Yeah. You know, I was like, "Jamie, come pick me up." So. Jamie then got hung up in the parking garage because they couldn't get out. So I'm out there standing in the street just holding my shotgun, you know. <laughs> just I wouldn't have make a mess with you. No, no, they weren't going to do that. <clears throat> but so up until yesterday, I thought I bought a shotgun with the barrel cut off of it. Well, me and Jamie get up here to the office and we take the gun apart. I'm looking at it. Well, in the barrel, stamped by Benelli, it says... 18.5. Yeah, 18.5. And which it's is, an 18 and a half inch barrel. Which is actually how, I mean, we it measured, measured it exactly. exactly what it measured. So, was it youth or? I, the only thing I found. I can't find no info on it that it was ever made. Yeah. Is a home defense gun, but everyone I found was not camo. They was all black. Yeah. And it did not have a. And it wasn't a super black. Eagle. They only done the home defense and the M2s. Yeah. And I, so I don't, but it's, the length barrel matches up. With what it stamped. Unless, what it, it's meant, unless somebody bought it to shoot rifled slugs, maybe? Well, it's yeah. not a rifled barrel, though. No, but you can shoot rifled well, slugs. Well, smooth barrel, yeah. yeah. And it's been shot. I mean, you can tell it's been shot. But what, so the end of the barrel, the camouflage was wore off, and it looked like it had been cut. Well, the closer we got to looking, I was like, you know, your sight rail up top. The, re- the rib on yeah. top. The rib yeah. on top. It hadn't been cut. It was still camouflaged all the way to the end. And I was like, look. If they would have cut that, it wouldn't have been original. You could have seen right. that metal. Being and it would right. have been the same length as the barrel versus yeah. being yeah. an 18 yeah. like, yeah. If it's just like one of us, I told Jamie, I said, if we blew a barrel off a shotgun, I'm not fishing to go through the trouble of notching that sight bead back factory and painting it. And ma- I mean, the camouflage max perfectly. Like, yeah. the sight bead is all exactly well, It painted. wouldn't have had 18.5 inches no, on the barrel it either. it wouldn't have 18.5 on the barrel. So I cannot explain it. So we, I went to Charles here local, and he made some phone calls. And guy's like, well, there's another company that makes barrels for him. It could be one of theirs. But then again, it is stamped 
manufactured Benelli. by Benelli. Yeah. So it's not aftermarket barrel. The camo is not aftermarket. Everything matches. I can't explain it. I hadn't shot it yet. Uh, I'm taking it to one of our probably best gunsmiths we have in driving distance for us today and look at it. Um, I hadn't had much luck finding a barrel, but hopefully this guy here says he's got a couple. So, so you ought to be able to just put a barrel on it. I'm going to yeah. put a barrel on it, and I got another uh, guy I'm talking to at our base for Arkansas. What is their name? Man, I know who you're talking about. Dang, what is it? He's got a gun from – or yeah. has some built. So it's yeah, – uh, looks, looks good. Angle Porton and Ballistic Specialist. Um, they are very well known in the Benelli world. They've done a lot of the custom shop Benellis, and – they do a lot of work. So I'm basically, once I get a barrel, it's going to them. It's getting fully worked. It's getting fully Cerakoted. Pretty much what I've seen of theirs, if you can dream it up, draw a picture they of it, they it. can make your gun look like it. I mean, it's, it's unreal. But if this barrel is still within tolerances, this 18-inch barrel, I'm going to get it threaded for a custom turkey choke, and it's going to be a turkey hunt machine. 18-inch barrel in the woods, that's yeah. going to be ideal. Oh, man, you talk about getting in or getting around with it. Yeah. Because it's super light. Yeah. So, the thing about it is, is, I mean, if this guy's got a barrel and you got five, four or five hundred bucks in a barrel, you can swap barrels out and you got two guns yeah. and less than a thousand, you know, around a thousand dollars. I'm going yeah. to dump some money in the work. Like, I mean, it's going to get a trigger job. It's going to get all the sure cycle internals. Again, it's getting stripped, getting Cerakoted. And what I was kind of going to talk about here, because I'm not a, I'm, this is all new to me. I've never had a shotgun worked or custom built or anything like that, but He's going in there and changing the forcing cone length in the barrel is the way I understood it. And he explained that to be whereas, you know, you shoot the gun and pattern it for turkey hunting, duck hunting, whatever, and you always have flyers. You always have a couple shots to step outside of the normal pattern. He said what that is is that the factory forcing cone, and I don't quote me on this, this is just how I interpret it, that it's so aggressive that it'll flat spot your pellets on the outside underneath the water and the flat spots will make them fly. And he says, doing a taper forcing cone, you eliminate that a good bit, not a hundred percent, but most of it. And it basically changes how the wad and how the pellets all travel through the barrel. And then they have their own custom chokes. I'm going to get the works, whatever I can get, whatever I want all of it. I want the best I can get. Yeah. And it's going to be a super, super, it's going to be a super, super, need to edit this out where Mark's wife can hear all this. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know what that's going to cost. I didn't tell her. I it's real cheap, Emily. Don't cost, you know, 50, 60 bucks. $400 all you know, all yeah. spent on Yeah, yeah. you're not have nothing. Not on it. Which I don't think, what I priced out yesterday, I don't think is that bad. Like, I'll I mean, be. If you could get a barrel for under a grand, you've come out like a rose yeah. on, a super, on a, a super black eagle. I think I'll be all in around 1,500 tops. Yeah. Which some people sound that's stupid. That's it to the shop and everything? Yes. Barrel everything. You can't buy a, a, the a three. It'll cost no. you eighteen hundred. Yeah, easily. plus sale. tax. So we'll see. I'll keep y'all updated on that. I'm kind of excited yeah. about it. But that was one of my big purchases that was not intended. We were getting ready to leave. Oh, it was so all the guys submitting and barbecues like, like I said, we're right across the aisle from the hunting booth that Mark was at, and they're all like watching. Like, is he gonna buy it? Is he gonna buy it? I'm like, man, I don't know. They're, and they was always like sitting there watching. They're like, wait, no, Mark. Yeah, like he ain't gonna really buy it, is he? And then. They don't know me. If I, I see mean, something I want, I'm pretty much going to buy it. for a shotgun, I'd do that all day long. Worst case, if if, Worst case, if a, I can't get a barrel for it, this barrel's junk. We can shoot turtles. <laughs> we can shoot whatever. It'll go in the headboard on a bed. Yeah. Like You ain't going to buy a home to fit. tractor shotgun. Yeah. <laughs> but we'll see. I'm going to take it to the gunsmith today, get some more details on it. Hopefully, I can buy a barrel today. And uh, it'll be going to Arkansas at the end of the week, I hope. There you go. Well, did y'all talk to any hunters while you are up there? We did. Yeah. We talked to uh, the same same booth I bought the gun from. They pretty much talked to every employee they had yeah. pretty much. Right. But, I mean, they were they were the only ones that were relatable to what we wanted to do. I mean, there was a couple of, like, outfitters and guide service there that had some monster deer. But as far as, you know, being relatable to kind of what Buck Junkies is, being your average jewel hunter, they, they fit the bill. So that's kind of what we've done. And one of the guys' names, I can't remember the guy you interviewed or talked to. It was uh, the older yeah, guy. Yeah, we talked to so many people I can't. I'm horrible with names. He um uh, he really kind of enlightened us on some stuff as far as like holding deer. You know, he's like you know we habitat. have habitat habitat right. creating a perfect habitat for deer. Yeah. I mean, he's forty seven acres. Forty seven. What he acres. had and he's shooting what forty seven forty seven, and he's shooting one hundred and fifty hundred. You know, he's he said he can he confident at one hundred fifty to one hundred eighty inch deer on his property. Wow, and, and holding them, but every every year, every but, year. But the, I mean, he's had and. I want to say the deer on the wall above that would come off his property. Yeah, both the deer on the wall come from his property. But 
then again, on that 40 acres, the guys beside him are on the same game plan he's on. So it's not, you know, if y'all working together, you yeah. can definitely yeah. make His that happen. His biggest thing, what acres. I gathered is, you know, he keeps the he keeps the crop there. He keeps protein and food there. But his biggest thing was hold the animals where they rest. You know, create the ultimate bedding zone for these whitetail. And he talked a lot of stuff that was very interesting. I got his card. And I'm we're gonna get him. I'm gonna get some more information from him. Whether or not we can do a phone podcast with yeah. him or something. But so what was his take on bedding area? Something that makes a. It, I've never thought about it, but makes a lot of sense. So we've seen it before here. I've been sitting, matter of fact, in Wayland Stand, there's a cedar tree sitting out there on the edge of the field, and any time it's cold, rainy, nasty, there's going to be does bedded in under that cedar tree because the amount of heat that cedar tree puts off that we never think of. And Just it's thermal good. heat from the sun yeah. where it's warming up. Yeah. So basically what he does, and Jamie talked to him a little bit more about this, is when he's got a tree he needs to down or something like that, he downs it and then turns around and basically builds a bedding area for them with these bigger tree log, just a log, log laying on the ground log. and they use it for shelter that knocks the wind off of them that log on the ground is going to absorb sunlight and it's going to get warm and basically they back up till they touch that log and then he always puts it on the yeah. north side of the field yeah like south facing slope same thing yeah you know because as dumb as it sounds sun east will sits in the west but the south is always gonna have sunlight so he said if you can back them logs up to where that south sunlight's hitting majority of the day that buck can stay bedded down right there back against the log it's knocking that north wind off of them and they can see out in front of them they got cover and i mean it's it's home i mean they got everything they need right there kind of what i got from it is and we've talked about this you know those big bucks the bucks we're after they're not i mean you might catch them in the rut slipping across that big wide open food plot but them bucks are staying on their home turf you know and he's like, that's what I that's that's the card I play is like, you know, if I can catch them in their bed in there, I'll shoot them in their bed in there, kind yeah. of deal. So it was it was interesting and it was a different style of hunting. Now, again, where we live versus up there, food source is not a problem once you get up there. I mean No, it's thousand acres. Yeah, it's plenty of, of protein. <laughs> it's plenty of crop agriculture. agriculture yeah. yeah. So <clears throat> they have that to their advantage for sure. Whereas we we don't. You know, what what food source we have is what we're putting in the ground and what we're planting. So that's the biggest takeaway is, like, you've got to have the food source, but once you get the food source, you've got to have that bed in there for them if you're going to hold them. So well, what, was, what was he feeding them on 47 acres? Uh, you know, I don't know if we got that far in. We got, we, I got so wrapped up in the – I know we talked about clover. Yeah, he was uh, doing clover. Because uh, I would think their winter's way harsher. Yeah. Oh, Michigan's yeah. way harsher than ours. A lot of their stuff is standing crop. It's so a, he says corn, they plant, they never touch it. Yeah, they, they eat it off the stock. Yeah, he Just for the deer. Standing yeah. corn, yep. Uh, beans, a lot of the agriculture stuff yeah. that uh, our population per acre is a lot more. And we would have to plant a thousand acres of beans if we wanted Keep to make it, it to yeah. feed. Yeah. You know, a little two acre bean field, they don't stand a chance. It ain't going to make it three weeks here. It ain't going to make it a week. So is he holding them year round or is he just yeah. doing that during deer season? No, he's holding them year round. Yeah. I mean, right after deer season, the crops and farmland buying, they're putting, they're putting that same crop in the ground. So, why should that buck go anywhere? All he does is walk out of that bed and there and go out there and eat at night or whatever during the day, and he's right back in it. So and we're not we're not saying from what I've gathered, we're not saying that your forty acre plot is going to make a two hundred steer. Make a yeah, yeah. But if you're in the right location, we talked about before. We're in a pretty good location where we're at. But if you're in that prime location like this, like you can make it work, you know. And that's part of I guess that kind of goes back to fooling that animal and. You know, you're working that land, and that's a lot, too. And it's pretty neat to go in there, and if you do all this, and in two years from now, you shoot 125-inch deer. Yeah. That's something to be proud of. Oh, I wonder if he's, like, strict, strict doe management, keeping that buck-to-doe ratio, you know. I don't think they have to worry about that up there like we do. It's it's The buck-to-doe ratio up there is nothing like we have here because, A, nobody up there hardly shoots does. Yeah. That's what. I wonder how you keep the does out of those areas and keep them from taking over. Do they not bed in the same type areas up there? I would assume or? they do, yeah. Because I would think, like, we did that, and the deer like it. It's all going to be doe bed. It's going to be <laughs> the doe hotel. We're going to have the doe hotel, yeah. yeah. That's what I was talking to Jay. I don't understand, which is, it's similar to Tunica Delta hunting around here. You got a thousand acre field, a couple hundred acre field with a two acre block of wood. Yeah, I don't, yeah. In my mind, that don't make sense on hunting, but like, I was talking to Jay, and he said, you know, up there, if you just say you see or your neighbor sees or somebody tells you you see a buck go across that field to that 20-acre patch of woods. 
He's he said, more than likely he's gonna stay in that patchy wood a couple of days before he moves out and you play the wind, get in there and kill it. And I was like, Okay, well what about this? He's like during the rut, he said there's numerous times he's set on a fence row, a property line. And I'm like, Man, I, said, I don't know. He said, Oh yeah, it'll be minus eighteen degrees or negative thirty degrees. He said he puts a toboggan on. Well, they don't call it toboggan. Well, we had this discussion. What well, they uh, call it up there? I can't remember what. They, anyway, they don't call it toboggan. Some, they, uh, uh, skull cap? No. no. They made fun sad. of us. We said toboggan. They like anyway. That's a sled to them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so Jay said he'll put it on. And he said when it starts freezing to where he, his mouth is, he said he'll move it to the. He said once it gets froze all the way around, he says time to go to the house. I'm like <laughs> heck no. I'm a sissy. I can't yeah. do it. He said they had, what, negative 50-something wind chill this year? It was the other day, yeah. I mean, we was up there, say, we got like, what, four, five, six inches of snow yeah. that one night. and 18 degrees. Them guys got shorts on, and I'm about to freeze to death. To death. <laughs> yeah, that's too cold for me. But the hunting is definitely, it's it takes an adjustment to go from here to there hunting. And I didn't really see, we talked about that, going up there on the side of the road. You just don't. We seen a right. couple of deer. But no, but, but you didn't see, like, oak trees. Wasn't acorns and no, stuff like that like we got but. we don't see that many hardwood trees now jay and them do have some of them packed there, there are yeah. a lot of hardwoods but like once we got up toward michigan it almost looked like snow forest it's i mean it's woods but it don't it's not like hardwoods like we have like some of them trees look like some mesquite trees you know oh, like yeah. they didn't scrubs yeah so different environment different, different all it is, completely different, different. Environment. yeah but they had their state actually plants all on the side of the road kind of like that uh sudan grass yeah, sudan grass we plant yeah. it, it was a lot of their stuff is all like native grasses on the side of the interstate, which to me I appreciate. You know, it looks good. It's not just a sage grass, whatever. They, I mean, it's actually whatever grows in that area is on the side of the interstates, and that might have been why we seen a lot of deer hit too. Though yeah. I was fixing to say you couldn't do that, Mississippi. You think of all the deer we hit now. <laughs> but then and again, just, I mean, they do keep close. You see a lot of red yeah. If they do road construction stuff. on the side of the highway, they gonna plant winter wheat, winter wheat or rye grass. Something's green comes up fast, and then they are gonna come back plant clover, which draws the deer to it to me that don't really make sense because you can see them if it was all eco edge out to the road <laughs> it man, pretty much is just up there. jump out <laughs> yeah. yeah which we did we've seen a couple of deer along the side feeding you know but nothing like here i mean nothing at all but we did but see a also the, times the, a year i've been going up through illinois that way and you see deer everywhere it just depends on like this time of year they're they're wherever the food is i imagine heck some of those there, you gotta think if you got that much snow on the ground there ain't nothing from to eat right now now, They're just the, doing good to make it through. Some of the does we've seen would probably have been 200 pounds. So, oh, yeah, easy. Up, yeah, for sure. Going back to the, the guy we talked to with 47 Makers, he had a buck he mount, that was killed recently that was mounted on the wall behind him. And it, it did. Like, his head looked funny because he was so big. The rack was the rack was big, but because of the deer, deer was, was so big, big the rack 270 look. pounds dressed. I mean, no, that's gutted. Oh, that's something wow. like that. That's something like that. He had, to be, he had to be 330 pounds. Easy. What do you mean? But I mean, he was—he's a big freaking deer. God, but, can you imagine I mean, that? He had—I would guess that was probably a hundred and fifty inch rack on that deer. Yeah, 140. probably. Yeah. Just guessing, it may have been bigger, but it didn't look that big because I mean, no it's joke. I mean, his head was as wide <laughs> as that hole. You know, that's one of them Canada deer. That's something. Yeah, we're gonna get up there. Did y'all? So did they have all the different mounts from like show off mounts and stuff? You know, the, something happened to that. that, that they canceled the taxidermy contest. Yeah. Oh, really? So. There that that wasn't set up like we thought. I don't know what the deal was or the backstory of that was, but they did do a big buck, big buck night. Yeah, I, but I think that was Saturday night. We'd already gone. Yeah, I don't something. know what that was, but they did. There were several deer mounts. There was a couple that was a uh, D and D outfitters or double D outfitters. Yeah, I think something like that. They had some studs. It was two hundred twenty inch deer. You know, it was it was big deer. But I'm sure that's all. They were they were protein fed. Yeah, I'm sure. yeah, yeah. yeah. But it was good. We we learned a lot. We got some content. Um, would you go back? I would go back. Yeah. I would definitely, after talking to some of them guys, there's several other, like, more hunting-related outdoor shows that were that were super nice. Now, I did I did get the boat once while I was up there. Oh, they had, they had some boats, boats, too? They had some boats. Yeah. You can- <laughs> so those are, I guess, they're Great Lakes. That's where they're fishing up yeah. there, right? A yeah. Pretty much. Pretty much. Trout, ex- stuff like that. Or- you could buy a $100,000 boat. You could buy a fishing pole, you could buy a gun, you could buy barbecue seasoning, you could get a pop and a jack and pop. Yeah, so I had to learn how to order that. <laughs> jack and jack pop. And pop. <laughs> no, I don't know what they call it. <laughs> Me and Mark got made fun of because the word Coke. soft drink was a Coke versus everything yeah. up there is a pop. But, you yeah. ask for a Coke, you get a Coke. Yeah, you get a Coke. And that's what I wanted. Yeah. You tell them a pop, I don't know what you want, you know. 
Oh. Well, that's what the lady told us. Said, if you want a, if you want a Coke, how do you know what it means? I'm like, well, you say I want a Coke, and you reply back, well, I want Pepsi, if I want Dr. Pepper, Sprite, whatever. And I, she said, well, that don't make any sense. I'm like, well, if somebody says they want a pop, what does that mean they want? She said, oh, well, that means they want a Coke or Dr. Pepper. I was like, well, it's the same, same thing. It's the same thing. <laughs> same thing. But it was a good trip. We'd definitely go back. Um, I we, It made me miss Ducks Unlimited show we used to have. Yeah. We talked about that last week. That's it was not on that level, but it was still good. I mean, when we got there at eleven thirty, shoot, it was it was several of, hundred people waiting in line, yeah, waiting to line get, get in. in. And that was like during the middle of the day when, not the weekend or nothing like this was Thursday at twelve o'clock. So they was rocking and rolling. I did learn. We, see, our sales tactic we got to work on that because we was there were some sales <laughs> sales people up there that was in leggings. <laughs> <laughs> They'd sell ice to Eskimo. Yeah, I was. <laughs> they were selling any kind of fish yeah. bait you were on, huh? Yeah, I would have bought matter. three or four of them, blow up ca- kayaks I had next door. You know, but you gotta have the right look. Yeah, we, we're missing that. None of us yeah. are gonna pull them leggings yeah. off quite no. like that. No, you know? no, um, no. Probably guys at Mitten made a heck of a sale. If you can sell a pellet grill to Amish guy, you're Doesn't freaking sell. doing something. Yeah, that is. You're doing something. <laughs> I told Jamie he come in there, and I guess what was he needing? He was measuring to see if it fit in his buggy, wasn't he? He was doing that, and then it was something to do with the. We're talking some, full blown Amish with yeah, the yeah, bug yeah. and everything. Rode it up to the sports show. Yes, something, they're everywhere up there. Which I thought that was so cool to see yeah, that. Yeah. It was something to do with a type of pan. I don't know if you're talking about just a regular aluminum pan, but some type of cookware that he had that had he, to fit he in. said if it fit in this, he was going to buy it. Well, I got a tape measure app on here that's pretty dang close, and I'm oh yes, yeah, going, it's going. Yeah. And heck, sure enough, the guy said, come back and bought it. You sell a pellet grill to the Amish, you do anything. <laughs> and he didn't even have leggings like on. He pulled it yeah, off, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah, If he'd had leggings on, he'd sold him two of them. <laughs> I don't know. Them guys there, I don't know. <laughs> it's I don't, I don't, over the buggy, huh? <laughs> the mitten guys, I don't know what they are, but they're some big old guys. They're Dutch. Six, eight? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I come up to their armpit. <laughs> yeah. I'm pretty tall. I yeah. come up to their armpit. Pretty much all of them are big. <laughs> but what would we eat eggs. while we were up there? Yeah, did y'all eat anything good? Man. So started out Wednesday night. Yeah, Wednesday we got there. J and M cooked some uh, El Pastor, and it was like tacos. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so he actually got the beef already ready to go. Seasoned, it was pork. shaved pork. But yeah, pork. Yeah, pork yeah. from uh, I guess our local Mexican restaurant. Yeah. Or whatever. You just go and order it by the pound. It's good. Already marinated. Already marinated. Man, he cooked that up. Him and his son Alec cooked that up on the uh, griddle. Had some cilantro and pico and Wolf Street taco shells. And, and a pineapple? He no, didn't have pineapple. pineapple. Really. I wouldn't eat that. That anymore. goes to the pastor. That was kind of, that what was just. tender. That was just the beginning of our good eats. We went from there. I don't remember what that restaurant we weighed at with Mitt and them. That was Butcher's in Grand Rapids. That was a top-notch restaurant. That so was, I, I've never, I've always wanted to be like a, to learn how to drink whiskey, you know, because I, I used to hate it. But I, I mean, I've, I've got to where I like it, and I like trying different whiskeys. Just to say you did, and this was a whiskey. This was a, how was it worded? A whiskey and something steakhouse. Yeah, I mean, it they, was pretty, it they was, probably had three hundred different bottles that you could try. You know, that was, I mean, this is the biggest whiskey menu I've yeah. ever seen. Bourbon, Scotch, bourbon, Scotch, you name whiskey, it, whatever, whatever you wanted. Yeah. So we went there, and what was the best one you tried? I got one of their old fashions, and it was with. One of the Blantons, but I can't remember what. But it was it was good. I probably get in trouble had for the old owl that you like. No, nah, I didn't even look that far. Uh-huh. I was just like looking. I was like overwhelmed. I was like, what the heck am I supposed to do with all this? But it was dang good. We had a bunch of food. Me and Jamie got hanger steak, which was like eating. Yeah, that was it was what? Water. It was hanger yeah. steak, potatoes, and I don't remember what kind of sauce or cream they had on top of it. It was good. It was good, real good. Did Sick. Jay bust out any of his his a version of summer sausage while you were there? Yeah. So, Jay, uh, Jay you're going to get roasted for this. Yeah. <laughs> so, we got there. We got back Friday, and uh, we were getting up. We went and got the hog because we cooked another hog Saturday for practice. And uh, Hefe, he brought some summer sausage over that was excellent. They it, cook it without a casing. Yeah. It was, it it was, was really, really good. good. Yeah. It was very good. So was, we were, it, was it like different than the kind we make? No. I mean, it was same kind of texture. Same and look kind of texture. Just, just it was just it was just ch- it was just ch- it just had cheddar. It didn't have jalapeno. Yeah. It was a little more tender mouthfeel because I guess it's not compacted in that casing, you know. Mm-hmm. But I mean, the fat content was right. It still held its fat. It didn't cook it out. Like yeah. 
Holds together? Yeah, holds together. Like if you would if I'd have sliced it, you couldn't have told me one was with case and one was without. Oh really? No. It was it was good. He rolled his out, made them look round. They look good. Jay <laughs> Jay brings out this I don't know what loaf of summer sausage he had. And he's like, Well, I think this is from about three years ago, four years ago. And I was like, All right. So he thaws it and there's started. Two, there's two things my taste buds pick up on. One is fishy taste, the second is freezer burn. Yeah. He is not fishy. <laughs> <laughs> he opens up and it's not even a, it's a different color. He's like, Yeah, this I think this might be some of my older stuff. And I looked at it, I was like, Older hell. It's aged. This is aged. Like <laughs> Me, yeah, he's like, you try some of it. So I got me a little end piece, and I was like, man, it's, it's not as good as his other. Yeah. <laughs> Jamie got it, and it didn't make it. Well, I yeah. got to watch, and several people went over and got it, and they kind of, woo, you know. <laughs> yeah. Jamie's like, you try some of that? And I said, yeah. I said, you to throw that in the garbage. Like, oh, that, needs be, <laughs> that needs to be gone away. <laughs> but Jay's wife, Shelly, she brought it in at the end. She Again, we get made fun of for stuff, but we did not know what beef and noodles me and we talked about this when he was down here. Yeah, when Jake he told us that's one of the best dishes that they. That it's like all, their signature dish. Yeah, signature dish. Like all I like know chicken is chicken and dumplings or gumbo. They make yeah. beef and noodles. If all of us good as what Shelly cooked, I'm finna cook me some beef and noodles. So my, what is? Explain to folks what beef. All right, and I'm gonna do it on buck, buck junkies level. Yeah, do it on buck junkies. So level. this is beef and noodles. You take a chuck roast and you cook it as perfectly as you can, and it does not have a gravy. It's it's got a sauce with it, but it does not have a gravy. Um, Perfectly rendered tender chuck roast. Pull the chuck roast out. Your rendering's in the bottom. Add your water. Guess what you cook your homemade noodles in? Not no store-bought plastic wrapper noodles. No, these were delicious noodles. And these noodles... Rolled out, cutting strips, noodles. I'd say fettuccine-sized noodles. They're a little bit thicker. They're closer to like a udon-style noodle, like a heavier, fatter noodle. So if you took a dumpling and cut it into tiny little ribbons... Yep. Is that about what it was like? A but this was it? long noodles. Like This is yeah. like spaghetti noodles. but More of a yellowish looking color than a okay. whitish. So, so take, it had eggs in it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Definitely. Um, take your water, add it to your drippings, and that's what you cook your noodles in. And there was still there was still like a sauce in there. So yeah. once you incorporate it, I think it's time you break the... So you take the noodles back out? Take the noodles back out. I don't know what liquid... It was kind of like a buttery beef, not gravy... Almost like if you just took a roux and thinned it down a little bit. Yeah. And mix it all up, chunk up that chuck roast, and to make it all better. You already got your your carbs and your starch. Yeah, it's it's your not a diabetic-friendly meal. You yeah. got your chuck roast. It was definitely had some butter cooked in it. You take you a big thing of mashed potatoes. Not no homemade, peeled, wrap, not no peeled wrap or out of hose or nothing like that. Homemade yeah. mashed potatoes. Take that spoon. You make you a pond in the middle. You put your beef and noodles in the middle of the mashed potatoes, and it is – like I literally sat over in the corner holding that bowl of beef and noodles, and it was just shoveling it. So oh, you eat that, you can go sit outside minus 30 degrees. Heck yeah. Ground, right? Or go to bed. It was one. good. It was good. One. And it was, it was dang good. Like, we are going to figure that way, and I'm, I'm going to have to get – Well, you do dairy noodles. Yeah. You can cook it shoulder down or hind quarter down. But like the thing that. about it is I can't make the noodles. Got to, yeah. the noodles is what made it. They did, I agree. Those noodles, I've never had noodles. I'd be like, them noodles taste good. Need a noodle lesson. Yeah, but I, I would. That's interesting. There, that was worth the. That was worth the drive. Sixteen hundred miles. How far we drove? Deer, eat deer noodles with mashed potatoes. Uh, we did. I want Jay talked it up, and I I got to try them. So. It's good. My, he's supposed to. I think he's bringing us some noodles down when he comes to cook a toka. Yeah, I think they're gonna make us a couple of batch of noodles. Will they keep? Will the noodles yeah, keep? They freeze yeah, they freeze them. Yeah, oh, okay, freeze them, okay. yeah. But they were, they were delicious. That sounds good. We did not go hungry, no matter. And then the hog turned out good. I'm guessing hog yeah. was good. Um, we're still, we're still learning stuff. We try some new things and getting some ideas on how to cook this hog to perfection. Um, we're getting pretty darn close. Yeah. Um, we could definitely tell a difference in a commodity hog and a non-commodity like heritage, heritage breed. breed. Yeah. This, I can tell you, that farm we got it to, outside of a hog, it's clean. You ain't going to find one that's got a prettier skin, smooth, cleaned out hog. Like that but I don't, know, I don't know what breed this was. It was literally, you go in there and pay 98 cents a pound. It was cheap, it, real cheap. Oh, yeah, it is it's, cheap. I mean, I wow. think the hog was 170 bucks. Yeah. And it was a 140 pound, 135 pound hog. So. And you told me you brought back some milk cow steaks, too, didn't you? I loaded up on milk cow steaks. So between beef and noodles and milk cow steaks, <laughs> it's worth the drive. Yes. The freak- on, how many steaks you get? I'm, I'm, I must got short chain in my pack. I think I got ten. I think I got ten. I think I got like fifteen pounds of ground beef, but no, it's two in each pack. It's two steaks in okay. each pack. 
So you should they're have. Smaller. They're smaller. Yeah, they're small young. loins. Uh, I was wanting the whole loin. Did y'all? Yeah, they, 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 you got to catch that when they're actually slaughtering them. Oh, okay. So he's got us on the list for them. But I mean, I don't know how many pounds of total. We so got. we got we got twenty ribeyes. I we think got, I don't. I, you got some of mine. I didn't get that many. We got eight chuck roast. Dang. We got eight skirt steaks, and we got twenty pounds of ground beef, and it was two hundred and fifty dollars all the way. Man, you can't beat that. Oh, and it's all packaged very very They're professionally. Quarter, yes. quarter cow. Yeah, it was good. <laughs> I, I hadn't cooked none of it yet, but I guarantee. If look, we've had wagyu, we've had Japanese wagyu, Australian, we've had prime, we've had American wagyu. This is my favorite. I'm not going to argue that. The only thing I can say about them is the steak's small. The steak's small. But like it's to the point to where it's marbled, and it's marbled, but it's not so rich you can't sit down and enjoy yeah. it. You know, you could have that for a meal. Are those I, Am- is the Amish the ones that do those up there? Or where does he get those? No, it's not Amish. No, it's Amish, just, just some folks. Yeah. It's just, just a, ranchers. a dairy yeah, farm yeah. right down the road. Yeah, a couple yeah. miles down the road. Yeah, well, what it is, it's the cows. That, I guess it's the steers. I guess. They keep them and slaughter them. Keep oh, them. bull meat. Yeah, yeah bull meat. <laughs> Shell, hey, Shell been eating prime meat the whole time then, hasn't Even she? know it, yeah. Yeah, growing up on bull meat. That's, that don't taste like that. <laughs> <laughs> what did you eat? Man, I, I went to the ball. I didn't even. I didn't go hunting. I went to the ball game down in Oxford. Hung out down there. We, we uh, you know, did that. I don't remember much of it. But <laughs> it was a good time. No, we had a blast. I didn't cook anything. I don't guess. So I, well, I introduced Jamie to Casey's Pizzas. Did you? Was that, was that as good as he says? Alec went and picked up a whole whole breakfast. Yeah, pizza. sixteen inch breakfast pizza and a pepperoni pizza. Yeah. They're pretty daggum good. Yeah. That's some Midwest delicacy. Yeah. I did have a pizza, a slice of some pizza from a place called St. Leo's in Oxford that was jam up. It was awesome. What else? No, we did. What else was that apple pie thing that Zoma's wife Casey brought with the ice cream? Man, it was good. Uh, y'all, ate, y'all ate dang good. Oh, we had a homemade, uh, we had an ice machine going Friday night, I guess it was. So it was a commercial ice cream, soft serve ice cream maker. At it 12 was, o'clock. 12 o'clock at night. Friday night, we're eating ice cream. And it's freezing outside, snow on the ground. That thing made ice cream in about two minutes flat really? from liquid form. Yeah. It was, it was. So I was impressed with. We need to get us one of them to go with the hot dog machine. <laughs> yeah, we had ice cream machine we and hot nachos, dog maker. hot dogs, and now ice cream. Ice cream next thing. That's a full blown restaurant. <laughs> well, guys, I know we, we we hate Mikey had a stand in today, but uh, you want to see if he can close yeah. us out? <laughs> take us out of there, <laughs> Mister Hall. <laughs> no, Mark, you want to take us out? Yeah, we appreciate y'all listening. Y'all make sure to check us out on all the platforms: podcast, YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, you name it. We're on it. Um, if y'all got any questions, hey. Before we get out here, Brian. Do we have any questions? Do we have any questions? Uh, we do. There's uh, this guy talking about trail. the trail cameras. Yeah. What is our go-to trail? What is our favorite one? Man, right now, my no joke has been the Tacticam reveal. I'll agree. They've got, I mean, they've got a new model. Um, I don't have the newest model. I got the last year's. But those Tacticams, the batteries last forever. I run those lithium energizers in them. Um, they, I mean, they're a little bit more pricey. They're not bad. The camera's not. It's the like camera's not. Thirty nine dollars. Well, I mean, it's not like the Hunt Smart one was the other one. If you're wanting to just yeah. get started and get something, you don't have to sign up for a plan. You get a hundred free photos a month yep. on it. Hunt Smart. Walmart carries them. I think it's Wild Game Innovations camera. Yeah, yeah. I think it's seventy nine bucks, and oh. that include like you don't all you do is download that. Yeah, that one's been a good one. Um, the, the other ones I've been running for a long time were um, covert. coverts, but. Yeah. Man, the tactic cam takes you, the best pictures. I'm going to tell you the tactic cam, and this I ain't get paid by either one of them. I've had better pictures, better results, better battery life, better camera life out of that tactic cam. I don't know how they're you know they make the cameras that go on your barrels yeah. for like taking pictures of shots and stuff. I don't know how any of that works. And this is based on we're pretty much Leave almost up. almost year, year round. I mean, we're yeah. moving them and changing batteries every so often. We bring them in right before about end of July to clean yeah. them up, yep. swap yep. batteries. They update go back update anything yeah. on them. I'll probably after we'll probably take them up after turkey season this year, just because we don't. You know, it is hard. Better get our summer plots in because if you're going to be putting in, doing a lot of bush hogging, they're sitting out on the edge of the field. You're steady taking yeah. pictures. That's pointless. Yeah. yeah, we don't need them then, but we'll put them back out early early. Uh, fall yeah like i'm talking august 1st we usually put them back out to see where the bucks are in velvet 
and to start getting an idea of what we have. But uh, man, I, I I wouldn't hesitate to buy another tank no. again. But that's it. But we appreciate y'all listening. Y'all got any questions? Again, let us know. We try to answer them at the podcast. We're trying to get in the habit of doing that. We yeah. tend to forget, but we're going to get there. But y'all make sure to check out buckjunkie.com. Look at the apparel. Look what we got to offer. And getting ready to do some more filming this week. So we'll get some more content here soon. That's about it. Well, we got